Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be in Copenhagen. I heard it's the birthplace of Lego, so I thought this image was fitting, given the title of the talk and the topic and everything. So, hi again, I'm Leah. Uh, here's the thing you might not know about me. I actually grew up in Greece, and specifically in the island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian. So, I also like making stuff, uh, especially open source stuff. Uh, there's tons of, Git, uh, of repos on my GitHub. I also like making standards and being, influ being involved in the process. Uh, in, uh, as an, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group. And in the past year, I've been exploring the strange world of academia and doing research at MIT. More, more, mostly centered about around making it easier for people to develop web apps. Um, although it's a bit early to talk more about my research. And I've also recently published a book called CSS Secrets. So if you like this talk, you should definitely give it a look. Anyway, enough with the shameless plug, and let's move on to more interesting things, such as pie charts. Pie charts are everywhere. They're in XKCD. They're in old windows on walls, on genitals, on food, on blackboards, and of course, on the web. However, if I told you to make these extremely simple pie charts, just two colors, no textures, no weird stuff, no multiple segments, with CSS and HTML and without any libraries like D3, like it's so basic, we should be able to make them with web technologies without any abstractions. And still, you would probably scratch your head a little bit. Like, how do I make the, the, them with web technologies? So this is uh, part of what I'm going to talk about today. Although I'm hoping that the takeaway will, won't be that much about pie charts, and it will mostly be about problem solving with CSS. And this is just the example problem we're going to look at. So. Our first idea, like this was my, using a skewed pseudo element was my first idea when I first tried to think of the same, to answer the same question. How do I make a pie chart with CSS? And my first idea was having a skewed pseudo element. So I'm having a div here with a class of pi, and I'm gonna add a before pseudo element on it, giving it, giving it no content, basically. Um, background, um, uh, padding of 50%, so I may, I give, I, it has the same dimensions, 100% uh, horizontally and vertically. Then let's give it an absolute position, and 50% from the bottom, 50% from the left. Let's give this overflow hidden to hide the extra stuff, mainly so I can see my code as well. Let's make the whole thing round. And now we have our basis for a very simple pie chart. Uh, right now it's showing 25%, but we can apply transforms to make it show different percentages. However, do you see there's something wrong here? It's, some, it's sort of starting to resemble a pie chart a little bit, but it's a bit off. So let's give it a different transform origin, which specifies where the transform starts being applied. So now we already have a simple pie chart. However, it's not particularly great. It works up to a certain point, and then not so well. But hey, I can fix that by in in increasing the padding, one could say. And then I can have even bigger percentages until it starts breaking again, at which point I could increase this even more. <laughs> but it will always break at 90. Uh, at 50%, it will always break because you're basically having, so, well, you end up having a div with infinite width, uh, infinite height and zero width. That's uh, skewing by 90 deg degrees. You can't really fix that. However, one could say we could special case 50%, and there are many ways to uh, color half a circle with a certain color, which is basically a pie chart with showing 50%. And we could add a class for percentages over half and apply, uh, apply different transformations so we could basically show percentages higher than 50%. 
Here, this has a, a, another a different class. Um, so somebody could say, yeah, there, I solved it. I made you pie charts with CSS. Aren't, is, aren't I awesome? However, pure CSS is not always enough. It's not always good enough. In this case, we didn't really solve anything. If, if somebody has to work with this code, they will curse us for eternity. Nobody wants to work with this kind of code. I feel like I want to go and wash my hands right now after this. Like, you, you can feel it, right? It's, it's really dirty, it's really hacky, it's, it's terrible. A good solution is not just something that works without JavaScript. JavaScript is not the evil thing here. JavaScript is fine if it helps us write better code. If you want a pure CSS solution, the reason people like pure CSS solutions is that CSS is reactive, so often we can end up with simpler code. That was not simpler than, than any JavaScript solution, um, or even just using a library. So for a good CSS solution, for, for, to have a good CSS solution, it needs to be flexible, it needs to be maintainable, it needs to be extensible. So what do I mean by that? How easy is it to change things? In the example of pie charts, how easy is it to change the colors? Mainly, or also the percentages, the percentage zone. How many edits do I have to make? And can I change them in line? Because a lot of the time I might want to show pie charts by some kind of JavaScript. And it's much easier with JavaScript to change inline styles than to actually edit the style sheet or do something weird like that. And also, is it dry? Yeah, dry is a principle for, from any software engineering, but it also applies to CSS. Having to repeat yourself multiple times, so DRY is an acronym that, start, that stands for don't repeat yourself. Anytime you repeat uh, code multiple times, it means that you have to change it multiple times, and it me means that if you, if you even just want to experiment to find the right value and you never plan to change it again, experimenting becomes extremely painful. It also needs to be maintainable. How much code do I have? The more code, the, the more difficult it is for a, future, for, for a future developer to understand what the hell I did there. Of course, it's, not, uh, it's just a rule of thumb. There can, be, uh, there can be short code that's very hacky and doesn't make any sense, and long code that is perfectly understandable. So, but this is, uh, statistically, the more code, the harder it is to understand. And does it need extra elements? Because that means that I will also have to modify the HTML to change something about it in, in, this, in, this, in the case of CSS. And how straightforward it is. This is hard to quantify, but this kind of feeling that, you, that this was dirty, that, that, that what I was doing was just terrible, it means the code was not particularly straightforward. It's not easy to say it's straightforward if it does this and it's not if it does that, but it's, it's usually something that you can feel. If you feel that what you're doing is wrong, then, yeah. Uh, and extensibility, by extensibility in this case, I mean how, how can I extend it to do more things? Like, how can I add more segments? Like, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm not just showing one percentage in the pie chart and I want to show something else as well, um, how easy it is to do it with the solution I came up with? Uh, can I animate the pie chart? even just to show the percentages or just continuously like a progress indicator. And also, can I have effects? Can I add a gradient to the colors I'm showing or a pattern or something or a shadow or can I make it 3D or do something weird like that? So in this case, in this code we've, we've, we've written, we need to special case 50%. We need to special case percentages over 50%. It's really difficult to figure out what how many degrees we need to specify of skewing, and it's different skewing for over half, uh, for percentages over half. And I, if, I, if I'm changing the percentage from something below 50% to something over 50%, I have to make a ton of edits. I have to change the, the kind of skewing, the degrees, the other rotation, um, change the background. So. I can change the colors easily. Um, in this case, I'm repeating them twice, but I can just group these rules together. So I can just do this. And now I've specified the color only, the, the pink only once. And for the gold, I could also take this declaration, put it here so I have the colors in one place and add this to it as well, because they're both backgrounds, so I can just group them. So I only have the colors in one place, and I can change them in one place. The code's still terrible, but it has this benefit. 
Also, the size can be changed easily, but like I explained, the value, is, it's terrible to change the value. It's not possible to set the value inline because I need to change styles on the pseudo element, which we can't actually set as an inline style. Uh, the good thing is it doesn't have any extra elements, but it has quite a lot of code and quite a lot of hacky code, which is even worse. And I could sort of have multiple segments if I added extra children instead of, in, instead of pseudo elements. And I could sort of animate it if I just hacked, if I just hard coded all these special cases in the keyframes. And I could add some effects, uh, like if I wanted a gradient, it would be a skewed gradient, but whatever, I could just apply it as a background, but it's super messy. So overall, it's not a particularly good solution. Can we do better? So the second solution I came up with uh, when I was thinking about this problem was using rotations. Like how, what transforms do we have to make custom angles in CSS? Skews and rotations. How can I hack rotations to show all these possible angles on a pie chart? So here's my element. I've already applied some rounding to it. And let's create our pseudo element here. Let's give it a height of 100%, uh, a margin left of 50%. Uh, and oh, and the, so the idea is that I will color half of my circle in a different color, and then I will rotate the pseudo element so it, it uncovers part of the circle. So actually, the gold will not be on the pseudo element like in the previous example the pseudo element will be pink. The color, let's comment this out for a bit, will be on my circle. I will give it two colors via a gradient. So let's add a gradient to it. So now if I show my element, you will see that it's covering that half of the circle that it's gold. Also, we need to apply some rounding to it to make it look like a, like a semicircle, which we will do with border radius. Um, so border radius actually accepts multiple values for each corner and also separate horizontal and vertical values, which is what we're going to do today uh, in this example. So the top left corner horizontally has a rounding of zero, the top right corner of 100%. Uh, the bottom corner also 100%, and the top left corner zero, and then vertically we want 50%. So now it's perfectly covering the gold part of the circle. And we can start applying a rotation to it. Of it's starting to look like a pie chart a little bit, except it has the same problem. So let's apply a transform origin as well to the and we want our transform origin to be on the center of the left side. So now, it's much more, you can see that I've already have this pie chart. And it's much more straightforward than before. I am only changing one value. And there's no weirdness when I'm going closer to 50% like there was with the skewed example. However, there is some weirdness uh, over 50% which again, I can fix by special casing it and adding, another, uh, and adding another class to it. So here I have two pie charts. One has a class of over half, and I can just give this a background of gold. And then it, 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 this way I can make all the percentages that are bigger than 50%. Of course, I also need to start the rotations again from zero. Turns are also a useful unit instead of degrees because they correspond to percentages more closely. Like in this case, it's much easier to tell that my percentage is 50%, 0.5 plus 0.2, instead of if I had degrees. Um, and you can see that this way I can show all possible percentages. Uh, the background is specified twice and I cannot apply the same trick of merging the declarations because here it's in the gradient. But I can apply another trick here to make the, the color only, apply, uh, only appear once. I can set it on the color property since I don't have any text and use current color here, which always refers to the color property. And then I can use current color here as well. So now I can change my color here and it will ch in only one place. However, it's still a little hacky. I, I still have to add a class to it. 
and uh, I, I still have to add a class to show bigger percentages. So it begs the question, how can I animate it, for instance? Can I animate it? So it turns out that I can. It's a little not very straightforward, but I could. I could animate the rotation from 0 to 0.5 turns. And I could animate the color as well from the inherited color to current color for the second half of the animation. Let's give it a name, whatever, call something. And now, let's remove the rotation from here and apply this animation to it. So we're actually applying two animations. Spin needs to have half the duration. And of course, it needs to progress linearly. And the color one needs to have double the duration. And also, we want it to abruptly change instead of going smoothly from one color to the other. Because if we have it go smoothly, you see what weirdness happens here. It goes from pink to gold smoothly, and we don't want that. We just want it halfway through to flip to, uh, from, from, um, from pink to gold. So step, there's a steps function that you can specify the number of steps you want. And step start is a shortcut to only one step. And let's make this infinite as well. Now let's reapply it. Oh, I knew this would happen. Ah, yeah, step start. Yes, so let's reapply it again, because Chrome does some weird stuff sometimes. Ah, uh, that's not good. That's not good at all. Um... No. Oh, right, yes. This needs to be halfway through, otherwise it doesn't change. Mm. Well, don't worry, I have the finished example if it doesn't. Yes, it worked. OK. I lost hope for a bit, but nope, it worked. So now that we have the animation, yes. Uh, <laughs> The next question we might wonder is, OK, but we didn't want an animation. We wanted a pie chart. How do we show a static pie chart with the percentage we want and being able to change the percentage shown easily? And this is where, uh, and this, is where this brings us to what I call static interpolation, which sounds very fancy and scary. But what it actually means is interpolation is the process of going smoothly from one value to another. And static means without any animation shown. And I'm, I'm going to show you what I mean right now. So this is a simplified example where I have a series of divs with a background of gold. And I'm going to apply an animation to them to make them pink. Let's give it a name, foo. And here's my animation. Let's make it linear as well and infinite so you can keep seeing it. And let's make it a bit shorter because this is too long. So you can see how it smoothly goes from gold to, to pink and then back again. <coughs> what if I want to statically specify the color of halfway between pink and gold? And I don't want to have to do the math. I don't want to have to think what color is halfway between these two. The browser knows how to do, how to do the math. That's how it, my, the browser shows me an animation. So how can I use this value in my CSS? How can I say 25% through that transition? But I don't want an actual animation. I just want the browser logic to do the animation. So we can actually do this via a few properties, a few relatively unknown animation properties. One of them is animation play state, which takes the value paused and pauses the animation. There's no animation now. It's paused. If I remove this property, there is an animation. Now there isn't. 
Now there is. Now there isn't. So, there's also a property called animation delay. And by default, it's zero. And what it basically does is it lets you delay the offset of an animation by the value you specify in animation delay. So if you specify an animation delay of one second, and by the way, animation delay is the second value in the animation shorthand, or it could be a separate property as well. So if you specify a delay of one second, you can see how it changes the animation progression. What most people don't realize about animation delay is that it also takes negative values. And that means you start part way th halfway through the animation, you start at a, at, a, at a later frame in the animation. So here, you start, at, you, you start with the animation being at 10%, since you specified a, a delay that's 10% of your total duration. And this is 40% of the total duration. However, if your animation is also paused, you will just get the 40% frame of your animation without any animation. So let's do that here. So we have uh, a two second delay. Let's make it 100 so that the math is easier. And let's set an animation delay of minus 50 seconds. So you can see that now all my divs have the color that's halfway through the gold and the pink. And I can even, so I have applied different classes to them, like P0, P25, P50, P75, P100. So I can style these classes accordingly so they each get a different point in the animation. Or by the way, I could also, of course, change this and step through the animation, which is also extremely useful for debugging animations. Like, because uh, sometimes you have this really short animation, and you're like, what did I do wrong with it? And you keep watching it again and again, and you're like, it's, it's just 300 milliseconds, I can't figure it out. And then you make it super long, and you sit there, and you're like, okay, please go to that frame, please go to that frame, and like, lots of seconds pass. And so this helps you from not having that problem. Okay, so let's give this an animation delay of minus 25. Let's remove the animation delay from here. So, 50, 75, and 100. And let's change the values here as well. Minus 50, minus 75, minus 100. So as you can see, it works with the four, uh, with the first four, but it doesn't work with the last one. Why doesn't it work with the last one? Because when it reaches 100 seconds, it jumps back to the beginning of it, it's the next iteration. So to fix that, we have to do two things. First, we remove the iteration count because it keeps re uh, replaying infinitely, and what we're doing is just stepping through that infinite animation, and we use another property called animation fill mode, which takes the values forwards, backwards, and both. What we need here is forwards. So what this value, what this, uh, value does is that it, it tells the browser, when this animation is stopped, I want to keep seeing the last frame. Don't jump back to the first frame. I want to keep seeing the last frame forever, or at least until I apply it again. So as you can see, now it's fixed. So. How can we apply this to our pie chart animation? Let's give it a shot. So here we have the animation we wrote. And we will first start by removing infinite. You will see some weirdness as I'm typing this. Uh, so let's make this 100 so that the percentages are so that the numbers are easier to work out also since this is half it's only halfway through the animation we do get, need to give it an iteration count which will be an iteration count of 2 and let's apply an animation play state of paused and an animation delay of let's say minus 30 seconds and let's reapply the animation so now you can see that we are seeing this is 20%, this is 10%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, and so on. Oh, and forwards. 
we forgot four words, which is why there was weirdness at 100%. So there is our pie chart. And we can just change one single value, and the percentage it's showing changes. There's one problem left. This animation delay is on the pseudo element. But we wanted to be able to change the percentage shown via inline styles. And we can't modify inline styles in JavaScript via, if it's in, you can't, we can't set inline styles of a pseudo element in JavaScript. So can we fix this, or do we have to accept it as a limitation? So the thing is, since the, since the animation is only on the pseudo element, and there's no animation on the pi element, on, on the div, we can just set animation delay here. It will do absolutely nothing, because there's no animation there. And we can get the, its value in the pseudo element by using inherit. So now we can just modify the percentage here, which can be set via JavaScript. So how flexible is this? We can change the colors in one place. We can change the size in two places. The value just by changing the animation delay. We can set it in line. No extra elements. A eh, little too much code, but whatever. It's, it's a bit hacky still, but somewhat less, I think. You feel free to argue. Um, we, can't set, we can't have multiple segments. If we want to show more than one percentages, we just can't do it with this technique. It is possible to animate. We saw that. And we also can't have any effect, because it kind of depends on having solid colors. So overall, it's sort of OK, not great. Can we do better? Of course we can. So when most people think of pie charts with SVG, they think of something like this, very little CSS, if any, and some path with some really weird syntax that nobody understands except the, the SVG spec authors, um, mostly. And we can study and find out what it means, and then we forget. I can tell you if you're interested, it moves the, the drawing. Um, it, it starts from the, the point 50 um, horizontally and zero vertically. Then it draws an arc to, um, yeah, I kind of forgot as well. Um, it draws an arc to the point, um, yeah, it starts from here. Yeah, it starts from here. Then it draws an arc with this as the center and this as the ending point. This is, so this ending point is the 40, 80. And the difficult part here, of course, is how do I figure out the 40, 80 and what percentage does it correspond to? And I have no idea what I'm doing here. Um, this is the kind of thing that Illustrator figures out for you. But if you have to hand code it, it's impossible. So most people would just dismiss SVG for pie charts because it's uh, if you have to hand code something. However, SVG has many tools. It's not just paths. So here, uh, we have a circle. Right now, it has the default fill of black. The view box has this weird uh, dimensions of 64 width and 64 height, which doesn't, act, which doesn't actually set the, the width and height, by the way. It just sets the units inside the SVG. Uh, and let's give it some styling. So. Since the SVG element is just any other, uh, just another S uh, HTML element, assuming this is in line in our HTML, we can just give it a background, just like any other, and a border radius, just like anything else. And here, we ha we we are starting to use the weird SVG CSS properties. One of which is fill none, because we don't actually want a fill there. And there's a stroke property, which lets you set strokes for your SVG shapes. There's a stroke width, which is on par with, which is similar to border width, but it doesn't take any lengths. These are units based on the units of the SVG we've specified, which is the units we've specified in the view box. So and there's also a really useful property called stroke dash array. How many of you have heard of stroke dash array before or seen it? Hmm, many, OK. So the stroke dash array property lets you do dashed borders. And it lets you specify the size of the dashes and the size of the gaps. And you might be wondering, how on earth is this useful for a talk about pie charts? However, let's make the width bigger. How bigger? Big enough to cover our circle. 
And now, let's make the gap of the dash array bigger. How much bigger? Enough to cover all of, our, all of the perimeter of our circle. Which, by the way, if you look at the SVG, the radius of the circle is 25%. 25% of width. O of what? Of 64. So actually, our radius is 65, 64 multiplied by 25%. So our radius is 16. So what do we do to find the perimeter? We multiply the radius by 2 and pi. So the perimeter, as you can see, I don't know if it's big enough, actually. As you can see, the perimeter is 100, which is very convenient in this case. Because if I set a, a gap of 100, it basically means I already have a pie chart whose dash width corresponds to the percentage I want to show. If I want to show the percentage 65%, I just set 65% as the width of the gap. And of course, you might, you might notice that it doesn't start from the top. We can easily fix that with a rotate. Yep. So we can show any percentage that way. No weirdness. No weirdness before 50% and after 50%. No weirdness at 100, nothing complicated, just seven declarations. And do we want to, what happens if we want to animate it? Well, if we want to animate it, we can just write a keyframes rule that animates stroke dash array from 0 to 100. Let's apply the animation. There it is. Thank you. So don't be afraid of SVG. SVG can be awesome. And do, what happens if I want transitions? I can have transitions. What happens if I want multiple segments? As you can see here, I can have multiple segments. Stroke dash array is just like any other property. If I want multiple segments, I, I could also utilize stroke dash offset, as you can see here. So here I've applied, I've, I've used SVG attributes that are exactly the same as, as, as CSS properties. Um, I just wanted to have a self-contained example here. Don't be scared because these are in the markup. They could be, they could be CSS properties separately. Uh, the only difference is specificity. Any CSS you apply to this has higher specificity than these attributes. Uh, so you can see what the stroke dash array is for this example. And you can see the stroke dash offset that's minus the number of uh, the width of the first stroke. So that other, I, could, I could still do it without dash offset. I would just need to specify a bigger width in dash array. It would need to be 13 instead of 8. So it, wouldn't, it, it would correspond to the cumulative percentage. So the numbers would be a little bit more tricky to, fi to, to figure out, but still uh, not that difficult. And did you notice the transition? That's just a CSS transition on, das, on, on, str on, on stroke uh, dash array. So SVG is pretty much the coolest solution we've seen so far. Only one edit for colors. Only two edits, it could be turned into one for size. Only one edit for value. Possible to set it in line. I mean, stroke dash array is just another property that we can just set on the, on the circle. We can totally set it in line. It's just markup. No extra, oh, extra elements are needed. Uh, the, the circle element. Uh, it's not a huge problem because we can always like have uh, one element and then some JavaScript that adds the extra, the, the, the extra element. But it is a drawback. And it's much smaller than any other code we've seen so far. And it's much more straightforward. Uh, we can have multiple values. We've seen how we could have multiple segments already. We've seen how we can animate it. And effect, effects are possible, but they would be SVG effects. They would be like SVG patterns and SVG gradients and all that. So they, ha they come with the shitty syntax of, of SVG gradients and SVG patterns, but they're possible. So overall, SVG stroke dash array is pretty cool compared to the CSS only solutions we've seen so far. So are we done yet? Is that the best we can do? Who thinks it is? OK, it's a tricky question, as you've probably figured out. Meet conic gradients. So you know about linear gradients and radial gradients. 
conic gradients are this kind of thing. And their syntax is very similar to the CSS gradients you already know. Like here I've added a color stop. Uh, I can make, um, okay, see this. I can make a hue wheel with them. Uh, aqua, fuchsia, wait, how's that spelled? Uh huh. Blue? Oh no, blue is after aqua, damn it. And my computer's being really slow. Okay. Come on. And I can make this round by a border radius of 50%. And you know how every color picker you see online has something like this and it's always an image? Come on, stupid laptop. Well, with conic gradients, it can just be a conic gradient. But they don't stop there, even though this is the most common type of conic gradient we see. For example, in our pie charts, we could do something like, let's say we want to show 30%, and then gold could be, yeah. So, yeah. You can't really get simpler than that. It's just a one-liner. Thank you. The zero, by the way, is a shortcut. It basically gets resolved to 30%. If you have a color stop position that's smaller than the previous one, it resolves to being equivalent, equal to, this, to, the, to the previous one, so that I can change the percentages in one place. And how do I add multiple segments? Easy peasy. I can just add more color stops. There. How do I change the position of this? Pretty easy. I can just change this. It, doesn't, it really doesn't get easier than that. And there are all sorts of other effects that you can make with conic gradients, um, although I'm running out of time. So conic gradients are specified in, CS, in CSS images level four. Uh, this is the spec for it. I've also added some examples to it recently. There's a pie chart example. Uh, they're also repeating versions. This is a crazy one. Yes, you can use them to make a checkerboard, and it's actually pretty simple, as you can see. So, conic gradients are pretty awesome. You can change the colors in only one place. You can change the size in one place. You can change the value in one place. You can set it in line because it's just a gradient. You can set the gradient in line. You, they don't require any extra elements, only three declarations two of which are just like padding and border radius. Super straightforward. You can have multiple values. I showed you how you can have multiple segments. Super easy to animate. You just animate the color stop positions. And some effects would be possible. Well, I'm, I'm kind of lying there. The only effect that would be possible if you, is if you actually change the color stops to have different colors so that you have some sort of gradient instead. But it is some effects. So overall, conic gradients are pretty awesome, right? They're pretty amazing. They only have one little problem, and it's a small one, but it exists. No browsers support them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really think browsers should get their act together, especially Microsoft. And I know we have some Microsoft people here. It's, it's much easier for Microsoft to implement conic gradients than it is for any other browser, because they only have to support one platform. And, and, and Direct2D that they're using as, a gra as their graphics library on Edge does support mesh gradients, which makes it super easy to create conic gradients. So come on, Microsoft, especially you, please. So. <laughs> And you might, if you're thinking right now, yes, I think that conic gradients are awesome and I really want them, you're not, you're not helpless in this. You're not just, you, you, your job as developers is not to sit there, sit around and wait for browsers to implement something. Browsers prioritize what to implement based on what you guys ask them to implement. 
the, Microsoft even has a user voice where you can actively go and vote on things. But they, every other browser, their developer relations team, they, they monitor lots of different channels, Twitter, bug reports. Um, some have uh, places on GitHub that you can ask for things. Um, on Mozilla, you can vote on issues. Uh, on uh, Chrome, you can star issues. They're, and even just voicing what you think, like recently I was talking with Google, who also can implement it because their graphics library supports mesh gradients. Um, so all, Google can also implement it easily. Their, their argument was, yeah, but developers are not really requesting it very much. So if, if that changes, we'll get conic gradients. It's, a, it's up to you, by, by large. That is the most important thing when browsers come to realize what to implement. One thing is, um, you've seen me demonstrate conic gradients here, and you've seen me write code for them. How did I do that if they're not implemented anywhere? So I actually wrote a polyfill, um, but the internet connection has been lost. Has it? Ah, yeah. Let's pray to the gods of the interwebs. I could join this network all day long. These things only happen during a talk. <laughs> Bloody hell. So, well, let's open it in a separate tab and see after the talk if we have time. Uh, otherwise. otherwise, we're running out. No, we have like wired I can't believe I almost fell off stage. This is a first. <laughs> I always heard other speakers say, and I fell off stage in this one talk, and I was like, I'm so glad this has never happened to me. And now, almost. <laughs> okay. Ah! Loading? Loading? Yes. So, this is the page of the polyfill. These code examples are actually live. Like, you can edit them and play with conic gradients yourself. Uh, and there are multiple examples here. And there are also some examples from people uh, from the community. Uh, so I'm embedding some tweets there that link to code pen demos from other people. So you can see what kind of cool things you can make with conic gradients. Just look at this. It's crazy what people made with it. Or like, even this. Or here. It's, it's, it's incredible what, what people can make, especially Anna Tudor. As you see, half of the demos are hers. She's pretty amazing. Uh, and if you want to support conic gradients, there is a section with links to all the bug reports, especially voting on the user voice thread. Is, it costs nothing, and it really helps, because other browsers also look at the user voice votes. Um, so, and you can use it in your projects, although I would advise not using it in anything that requires too high performance, because um, it's not particularly fast. It basically has to build a data URI and shove it into an SVG, which is also shoved into another SVG, so that it gets the aspect ratio that gradients would have by default, you know, the, how they adjust to the dimensions of the element. It's kind of a hack, but it works excellent for talks and experimenting with it. So, after spending about 40 minutes discussing how to make pie charts, are pie charts a good idea, actually? How many of you have heard of Edward Tuft? So, he's like a god in information visualizations. He, he, he's like a huge, huge name in, uh, in information visualization. And he's, he wrote in one of his books, a table is, al is nearly always better than a dumb pie chart. The only worse design than a pie chart is several of them, for then the viewer is asked to compare quantities located in spatial disarray, we'll talk about that, both within and between pies. Given their low data density and failure to order numbers along a visual dimension, pie charts should never be used. Well, there are people arguing with this. Uh, there are cases where pie charts are a good idea, but he does have a point. Look at this pie chart. Which segment is bigger? Which segment is smaller? Can you tell with certainty? They're all the same, but you can't be sure. What about this one? Which one's bigger? Which one's smaller? What's the difference? In a bar chart, you can, you can tell instantly. 
with a pie chart, you, 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 you can't be sure. So yes, Taft does have a point, but pie charts are a great way to show different, huge differences between uh, fewer numbers of percentages, like if you only have two or three numbers, especially two. And it, it, it really shows the trend. It, it makes it very easy to see if something is bigger or smaller than 50%, which bar charts don't. It's more difficult to see if a bar, if a bar is, half, is less than half or more than half of another bar. With pie charts, it's super easy. Uh, and also, if everything else is equal for a, cer for a certain kind of data, pie charts are preferable because there's actually research that proves that people like round shapes. I can tweet the link to the survey, uh, to the study, to anybody who's interested. But people r like round shapes. We're rational creatures. And even if pie charts are not suitable for your data, this talk never really was about pie charts, was it? Thank you very much. And you can find the slides over there uh, on my GitHub. I, it, it ha I haven't pushed the latest changes, but you can, I, will, I will do so after the talk. And many people are asking me what slideshow framework I used. Uh, it's actually mine. It's on that repo on GitHub as well. And feel free to tweet me any questions or ask me in the after party bef before I have the first, before I have my fourth or fifth beer, I guess. Thank you so much, Leah. Thanks. <laughs>